And so we'll pick up immediately reading there in verse 12. When I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, Paul wrote, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. But I had no peace because my dear brother Titus hadn't yet arrived with a report from you. So I said goodbye and went on to Macedonia to find him. But thank God, he has made us his captives And I want you to watch this phrase particularly. He has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. So Paul here is comparing The Christian journey with a victory parade and procession that people in the first century would have been very familiar with. The word described the victory parade of a Roman general when he returned to Rome or to his home city. The closest thing we have to something like this is a ticker tape parade that takes place in New York City right down broad. Over the duration of the Roman Empire, there were 320 of these triumphal processions, and they all followed a set custom. As soon as the battle was won, a herald would run from the battleground to the city to proclaim the victory. And by the way, our biblical word for preaching is the same word to describe the announcement of the herald. When the residents heard the good news, they immediately began to make preparations for a magnificent victory celebration. And on the morning of the parade, the Roman priest would burn large amounts of special incense so that when the citizens woke up and sniffed the air, they would say, ah, yes, today is the day of the victory parade. And they would start hitting the streets waiting for the parade to begin. Leading the parade would be the priest swinging the censures, bearing that special incense, followed by musicians, which were sort of the forerunner of the modern marching band. And they would be followed by victorious soldiers carrying the treasures and the spoils of war. And then the central figure would be the victorious general riding in a beautiful chariot. And his chariot would be pulled by beautiful horses, usually a white horse. Sometimes, for instance, when Pompey conquered Africa, his chariot was pulled by two elephants to signify where they had conquered. And for Mark Antony's victorious parade, he had two lions pulling his chariot. The people of the Roman Empire were very familiar with this victory parade. There were 320 of them, as I said. Walking behind all of those victors, chained to the chariot, of the victorious general would be the leading officers of the defeated army. And these officers would be led into the city, chained, signifying that they had been defeated. It was such a humiliating experience for them. For instance, in 30 BC, Cleopatra committed suicide with the asp to keep from having to endure the humiliation of being chained in a chariot owned by Octavian Caesar. These defeated officers were usually facing execution and they knew that, but sometimes, depending on the mercy of the conquering general or the talent of the defeated soldier, he would keep them alive and keep them as his slaves. 
Now, while the Roman soldiers saw their victorious general and defeated officers chained to his chariot, they would just be shouting praises and throwing flowers at the victorious general, and they would sing victory songs about their great general. And that, my friends, is the word picture Paul chose to use in writing to the church at Corinth He has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now, I want you to notice that again. In Christ's triumphal procession. In this picture, we're not the ones riding in the chariot. We may be someday, but we're not here. The conquering general is the one riding in the chariot. And he is the comparable to Christ here. He's the king of kings. He's the captain of our salvation. It's not our victory that's being celebrated. That'll happen someday. But here, it's not our victory that's being celebrated. It's his victory that is being celebrated. The chariot is a one-seater just for the winning general. And this verse doesn't say God makes us triumphant. Instead, it said he leads us in the triumph of Jesus. When you realize that you are in Christ and that Christ is in you, you understand that you're living in victory, but it is not your victory. It is Christ's victory. And he's the one in the chariot. The Bible teaches us that he won that victory by wiping the slate clean, the old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. Paul here to the Colossians Again, making the same reference to this winning parade and what happens to the conquered people. Jesus won the victory on the cross. There's no need for us to have to try to win. We've already won in Christ. We don't fight for victory. We are fighting from victory. As you move... From the end of the verse to the middle, we see that it says, who leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. Now, in this picture that Paul painted for us, Jesus is the conquering general, but who are we? Where are we? It's important for you to understand this. We're not in the crowd cheering. We're not even a part of the victorious army, the winning soldiers behind him. We are the ones being led. We are the captives being led by the general. He has made us his captives. We are the ones being led by the victorious general. We're the conquered officers chained to the chariot because we've surrendered to the victor. Remember who wrote these words. Paul is the one who wrote these words. He had been the enemy of Christ. At one time, he was, he was on the opposite army from God. And then you remember he was, he was on the road to Damascus to pick up and persecute Christians. And he saw a great light from the sky that blinded him and drove him to his knees. And he said, Lord, who art thou? And the Lord said, I'm the one you've been persecuting. And that led him to change his entire life. He was told to go into the city and there it would be told him what to do. And on that day, Paul surrendered his life. And from that moment onward, he was chained to the chariot of Jesus. He was one of these captives that our text verse talks about. And whenever, that's why, whenever you read a letter written by Paul, have you noticed how many times he describes himself as a slave of Christ? A slave of Christ? He does it over and over again. I mean, it's a dozen times or more in the book of Romans as a slave of Christ. That's why, as he wrote here, 
And Colossians 1.21 says, this includes those who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. When we surrender to Jesus, we haven't lost, we've won. Our victory is assured, like Paul, when we completely surrender to him and we become the slaves to Christ behind his triumphal procession. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by his baptism in water and by his shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit who is truth confirms it with his testimony. In conquering, there's an important principle for, to be understood here, my friends. If we want to be a conqueror, Romans 8 says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If we want to be a conqueror, we must first be conquered. That's what this text is describing. That's exactly what it's saying. There are many paradoxes in the Christian life. Do you know what a paradox is? Well, of course you do. It's a pair of doctors. But Now, that's funny. I don't care who you are. And if you didn't get it, it is not my fault. But there are a lot of paradoxes in Scripture, such as to gain your life, you must lose it, right? To get, you must give. Give, and it will be given to you. That sounds paradoxical. Jesus said, if you will save your life, you must lose it first. And the only way to be victorious in the Christian life, is to first lose. Lose your life and surrender to Jesus. Most people don't like the idea of being chained to a chariot, even if it is the chariot of Jesus. They have what you might call a negative chain reaction. Look, I... Again, it is not my fault that you're not sharp. But truly, the, the image of being chained to a chariot isn't very inviting for any of us. You know what I want to do? I want to ride up front with the Lord. I don't want to be chained way back there. After all, we often think the Lord needs our help. Lord, we're going so slow Everybody is passing us by. Can't you sort of put the pedal to the metal here? You may not have prayed it that way, but you've prayed something similar to that at some time or another. Sometimes I get tired and say, Lord, why don't we just pull over and stop for a while and have a picnic? I'm tired. I have a lot of stress. I have a lot of anxiety. But I'm not in the front of the chariot. He is. I've tried several times, I'm afraid, to even take the reins away from the Lord's hand because sometimes I like to be up front in control, don't you? But the only way we can have victory, according to this text, is when we surrender to the Lord and we allow him to lead in triumphal procession and we are the defeated captives behind. And then verse 15 picks up. The very next verse in our text picks up and says, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance riding up to God. But this fragrance, this is such a brilliant verse that I can't wait to discuss it here in a minute. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. Have you ever noticed that? Boy, I have. To those who are perishing... We're a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this? You see, we're not like the many hugsters who preach for a personal profit. We preach the Word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching over us. Have you ever had anybody ask you, I just did tonight. 
Have you ever had anybody ask you, what's that fragrance you're wearing? Just had it happen when I walked in here tonight. Don't go anywhere, honey. It's about you. I, okay, you got to go somewhere. I see that. It's got to go to a children's thing. But so I get asked this all the time. I've been asked this for the last 25 to 30 years. And that's what the fragrance is. I have not worn any single other cologne or fragrance other than this one for the last 25 years plus. Now, I'm not like Fred Atkins. You go in Fred Atkins' house, how many bottles, jo don't, no, Fred, don't you answer, Joanne answer. How many bottles of cologne does he have? How many? 90? I thought it was more than that when I saw it. He, he must have cut back. Um, that's good. That's, that's good, Fred. You should, that's good, Fred. You should cut back a little. This is the only thing I wear. The only thing I have worn it because when she became a Mary Kay, whatever they call it, uh, I don't know what they call it, but it was, it's high up. And when she became one, she could buy it for me at less than half price. And so she did, and I liked it, and she liked it, and apparently everybody else likes it because I get asked about it all the time, all the time. And so I constantly get asked, what's that fragrance you're wearing? Smells can sometimes be very, very appealing. But let's face it, there are some great smells and there are some awful smells. I mean, awful smells. I read about a guy who sent flowers to his secretary on Secretary's Day, and he wasn't really thinking when he wrote the words on the back of the card. And the words said, these flowers may lose their fragrance, but you will smell forever. Well, that's the way to make points. So, real quick here, I don't have time for this like it's the having fun question, but what are some of your favorite smells? Quick, just scream them out. What's some of your favorite smells? What? Anybody that said anything other than bacon wasn't telling the truth. I'm just telling you. There's no smell like bacon now, I'm telling you. That you might also say coffee, or you might say donuts, or bake fresh baked bread, or you may say, I even like the smell of fresh cut grass. I do. And a number of, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we might say are some of our favorite smells. Did you know smell sells? It does. How many times have you followed your nose to a cinnamon bun shop in the mall? Yeah. Did you know this is true? In California, a gas station chain has added a dispenser at the pump that releases the smell of freshly brewed coffee, hoping to lure customers inside to buy coffee. And it's working. I mean, they've already got our eyes and our ears, and now they're going after our noses. Well, the focus of the parade was the victorious general riding in the magnificent chariot and chained to the chariot were the conquered leaders who had surrendered and Paul used that as a metaphor of the Christian life and he saw us as the conquered enemies who are chained to the chariot but then he compared us to the fragrance of Roman triumph and so he in effect was saying how are you smelling these days as a Christian, how are you smelling these days? You know, people can often tell what you've been doing by how you smell. If you have just exercised an hour or so, there is a certain aroma about you that says, stay away from me. When you've just eaten a meal with a lot of garlic, it's usually pretty obvious to anybody around. Can I say this? When you exit one certain room in your house, there is a smell that indicates where you've been and what you have been doing. This passage is teaching us that wherever we go and whoever we meet, 
We should be a living advertisement of what it means to belong to Jesus. When you put on cologne or perfume, you really don't have to do anything except walk near a person for them to catch a whiff of your fragrance. When you spend time with Jesus in worship and devotion and service, people just sense there's something different about you. It's like you're wearing the fragrance of Christ. Do you remember back there in Acts chapter 4? When it says of the disciples that even though they were ignorant and unlearned men, the Jews said, there's something different about them. You can tell they have been with Jesus. It was the fragrance of Christianity had been poured all over them. St. Francis of Assisi was the one who said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. When you are wearing the fragrance of Christ, you are preaching the gospel at all times. Even when you're not necessarily speaking. People will often recognize that you are a Christian without you having to say, I'm a Christian. The fragrance of Christ is simply the personality of Christ that is revealed in your life through the Holy Spirit and his fruit so that when you are full of the fruit of the Spirit of Jesus, he will display the sweet-smelling fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control in your life to the degree that other people smell it. They do. Smells so important. I grew up, I've showed you pictures of this many times, and I had a great church atmosphere growing up uh, in the Radnor Church in Nashville. And um, we, we had lots of weddings. We had a lot of young people, a lot of weddings back then. One of my brother's friends, I remember when he got married, some of his friends played a terrible wedding prank on him. As the wedding car sat out in front of the Radnor Church building, these pranksters went outside and removed the hubcaps and put about a half a pound of raw shrimp inside each hubcap and then carefully placed them back on. So that when the bride and groom came out and drove off, wasn't too bad at first, but they were going to Panama City, Florida on their honeymoon and it wasn't long until they started, whew, what is that? And they got out and they started, and they, they checked everything, they checked the front seat, the back seat, they opened the hood, they checked, they checked uh, the uh, trunk. They checked everywhere. They couldn't find anything wrong. And the smell just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. By the time their honeymoon ended, they could barely even stand to be in the car. They took it to a mechanic when they came back. And the mechanic put it on the lift. And he couldn't figure out either at first until he noticed a, a, the strongest smell was coming from a hubcap. And he took the hubcap. And there were all those <laughs> raw shrimp. <laughs> And when they discovered the culprit, their friend became an ex-friend pretty quickly. Now, we're all familiar with bad smells. This passage teaches that the same fragrance, now this is what I couldn't wait to get to because this happens to every one of us in every day in life. This passage teaches that the same fragrance that gives life to some smells like death to others. The fragrance is the same. How can that be? How can that be that it's the fragrance is the same and to some it smells like life and to some it smells like death? Well, in order to understand it, you have to return to the image of the Roman victory parade. This incense is being burned all the time and on the morning of the parade, the Roman people who have been victors come out and they celebrate and they can't wait to see the parade and, and, and the conquering and all of those things and they're so excited about it. But... If you're on the losing side, being drug along, it smells like death because it probably is going to end in death. Same fragrance, two totally different responses to it. Ah, surely you're following Paul's analogy here. 
The fragrance of Christ affects people in two different ways. To some, it is the aroma of life. We come here together like we do on Sunday or like we did tonight, and we sing a song about heaven, and we talk about eternal salvation, and and we're excited to see one another. We're going to spend eternity together that way in God's family. We have been blessed with forgiveness and grace and mercy and thanksgiving in every way. Every, what Paul finally just gave up naming them all and he said every spiritual blessing in every place. <laughs> he finally just said. And we come here and we experience that and, and it's, a, it's a great smell for us. It's a great fragrance for us. I always love going back and reading some of the comments of the people who have watched. You know, we didn't, weren't able to do this till COVID. We didn't know, uh, you know, we didn't have any kind of uh, video or uh, digital presence anywhere. And now it's always fun to go back and read what some people will say on either Facebook or on YouTube as they make comments about the service. And they, even, from, even from afar, we smell from afar. There will be people talk about how they are so blessed from hundreds of miles away even. But at the same time, there are people in my life, in your life, who think we stink. And they think what we do stinks. And they can't imagine for the life of them why we take every Sunday and every Wednesday and come and study God's Word and sing praises and give of our money freely and and serve Uh, and teach children's classes or keep a nursery. They can't for the life of themselves understand why anybody would do that. You people are nuts. You stink. What is wrong with you? Exactly. Exactly. What Paul is talking about here. I want you to notice this. The Bible says that those who think our message stinks are perishing not they will perish but they're perishing right now they're in the process of spiritual decay whoever believes in the son has eternal life whoever rejects the son will not see life, and God's wrath remains on him presently. He doesn't say that those who reject Jesus will have God's wrath on them. He says, has God's wrath on them. But of course, the good news is, the smell of death can quickly change to a smell of life. There are people I'm looking at that I know. I know your story in this auditorium tonight. Who once thought the message of Christ stunk until they believed and obeyed it. And suddenly their sense of smell changed even though it's the same fragrance available. Paul, the one who wrote this, thought the Christian message stunk so much that he was active in having Christians put to death. Or imprisoned. But after he met Jesus, the odor didn't change. But Paul's perception of it changed. So, the question each of us ought to ask ourselves is, what kind of fragrance am I leaving when I encounter other people? Am I spreading the beautiful fragrance of Christ wherever I go. Even though it will irritate some, I don't intentionally irritate them, but neither should I do anything to cover up or mask that fragrance of Christ. Let me conclude by telling you a true story about a woman who left an amazing fragrance of the life of Jesus wherever she went. Her story was told a few years ago in Leadership Journal I clipped it out, kept it, because to me it was so powerful. Dr. Martha Myers was an obstetrician who had surrendered her life to missions from the time she was a young girl in Montgomery, Alabama, 
And for the next 25 years, she devoted her life to serving poor women as a missionary doctor in Yemen. Yemen, highly Muslim, one of the most dangerous places in the world. This is a picture of her near the end of her life. She delivered thousands of babies, performed difficult services without charge, all in the name of Jesus, all as a part of mission work. She didn't have to preach the gospel with words. She demonstrated it by the way she lived and loved and cared for her patients in the name of Jesus. And that fragrance attracted many of her patients. But to some, to some it was a foul stench. On December the 30th, 2002, the husband of one of Dr. Meyer's patients, Ali Abdul Razik, his wife had been assisted in birth twice by Ms. Myers. He walked into the hospital in Jibia, Yemen, Yemen, concealing a rifle under his coat as if he were cradling a baby. He pulled the gun out from under his coat and shot Dr. Martha along with two other missionaries who were working at the hospital to death. The shooter was later arrested and he was asked why he killed the American. He said, because my wife was a patient of Dr. Myers and had delivered her babies and had treated her so beautifully through it and had told him Dr. Myers showed her love beyond anything she had ever imagined was possible in this life. And that convinced Ali, who was a member of an Islamic jihad group, that she had to die. And here are the words he used as he explained why he had to kill her. Such love could turn my people from Islam to Jesus Christ. And he's right. I've watched love turn people from desperately foul, smelly situations and circumstances in life to Jesus. And he thought by killing Dr. Myers, he could kill that love. He thought he could blot out her fragrance of Christ. But he was wrong. Dr. Myers requested to be buried in Yemen instead of Alabama so that her grave could be a living testimony to her life and her witness. And thousands have visited it through the years. And her story has been told all over the world time and again. Because you can't kill the real love of Christ by killing the body. Remember, that's what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. Don't fear him who is able to kill body. Fear him who is able to kill soul. You can't kill the fragrance of Christ in a truly committed believer. The fragrance just keeps going on even after our life, into the next life, and even into eternity. So, how are you smelling? Is a question all of us should seriously consider.